I was at my bedroom table with a notebook open wide when a giant anaconda started winding up my side. I was filled with apprehension and retreated down the stairs to be greeted at the bottom by a dozen grizzly bears. We tumultuously tussled till I managed to get free. Then I saw, with trepidation, there were tigers after me. I could feel them growing closer. I was quivering with fear. Then I blundered into quicksand and began to disappear. I was rescued by an eagle that descended from the skies to embrace me with its talons, to my terror and surprise. But that raptor lost its purchase when a blizzard made me sneeze, and it dropped me in a thicket where I battered both my knees. I was suddenly surrounded by a troop of savage trolls who maliciously informed me they would toast me over coals. I was lucky to elude them when... We built a ship upon the stairs, all made of back bedroom chairs, and filled it full of soft pillows to go a-sailing on the billows. We took a saw and several nails and water in the nursery pails. And Tom said, Let us also take an apple and a slice of cake, which was enough for Tom and me to go a-sailing on till tea. We sailed along for days and days and had the very best of plays. But Tom fell out and hurt his knee, so there was no one left but me. We built a ship upon the stairs, all made of back bedroom chairs, and filled it full of soft pillows to go a-sailing on the billows. We took a saw and several nails and water in the nursery pails. And Tom said, Let us also take an apple and a slice of cake, which was enough for Tom and me to go a-sailing on till tea. We sailed along for days and days and had the very best of plays. But Tom fell out and hurt his knee. So there was no one left but me. A nightingale that all day long hath cheered the village with his song, nor yet at eve his note suspended, nor yet when eventide was ended, began to feel, as well he might, the keen demands of appetite, when, looking eagerly around, he spied far off upon the ground a something shining in the dark and knew the glowworm by his spark. So stooping down from Hawthorn top, he thought to put him in his crop. The worm, aware of his intent, harangued him thus, right eloquent. Did you admire my lamp, quoth he, as much as I your minstrelsy? You would abhor to do me wrong as much as I to spoil your song. For t'was the self-same power divine taught you to sing and me to shine, that you with music, I with light, might beautify and cheer the night. The songster heard his short oration and, warbling out his approbation, released him, as my story tells, and found a supper somewhere else. Mark Twain once wrote a letter to his daughter Susie on behalf of Santa Claus. Santa Claus wrote that he had received all the letters sent by Susie and her baby sister. He also wrote that he could read well the letters which she and her baby sister wrote, but he could not read well the letters which she had dictated through her mother and nurses. Santa Claus also informed her that he had kept all the things she and her baby sister had ordered. He had come down the chimney at midnight 
while she and her baby sister were sleeping. Santa Claus further wrote that he could not understand what Susie exactly wanted, which was written in her mama's letter. He asked whether it was a trunk full of doll's clothes. Santa Claus informed Susie that he would visit and talk to her at nine o'clock in the morning. He instructed that Susie should talk to Santa Claus through the speaking tube and must tell every single thing in detail. After that, Santa Claus would go to the moon and would bring the things. Santa Claus further instructed that as soon as his footsteps would be heard in the hall, everyone must stop talking. After he goes up through the chimney, Susie could go and peep through the dining room doors to see the things she wanted. Santa Claus said that if he leaves any mark of his foot on the floor, it should be kept forever as a memory of his visit. The mark would remind her to be a good girl. I started on my homework, but my pen ran out of ink. My hamster ate my homework, my computer's on the blink. I accidentally dropped it in the soup my mom was cooking. My brother flushed it down the toilet when I wasn't looking. My mother ran my homework through the washer and the dryer. An airplane crashed into our house. My homework caught on fire. Tornadoes blew my notes away. Volcanoes struck our town. My notes were taken hostage by an evil killer clown. Some aliens abducted me. I had a shark attack. A pirate swiped my homework and refused to give it back. I worked on these excuses. So long, my teacher said, I think you'll find it's easier to do the work instead. An elephant is hard to hide. It's rather tall. It's fairly wide. It occupies a lot of space. You just can't put it any place. It's quite an unrewarding chore to try and cram it in a drawer. A closet's somewhat better, but you're apt to find the door won't shut. An elephant beneath your bed will manifest both tail and head. And in the tub, there's little doubt that it will soon be singled out. An elephant won't simply sit, it tends to move around a bit. This trait, when coupled with its size, makes it a nightmare to disguise. An elephant, if kept around, is almost certain to be found. Your parents may suspect one's near when peanuts start to disappear. An elephant is hard to hide, I know it's so, because I've tried. My family should detect mine soon. I brought it home this afternoon. Raj and his family went on a trip to Kolkata. Raj's grandfather and grandmother lived there. Raj, his brother Ramesh and their parents got down at the Howrah station. They took a taxi to Jodhpur Park. Raj and Ramesh were very excited to see the Howrah Bridge, now known as the Rabindra Setu. Then their taxi crossed Eden Gardens and Victoria Memorial. Raj's family reached Jodhpur Park. The grandfather and the grandmother welcomed them warmly. Grandmother got traditional rasagolas and sandesh for them. She also prepared fish curry and steamed rice. After this, they went out. Ramesh was astonished to see a tram and they had a tram ride. The very next day, the family went to see Victoria Memorial, Birla Planetarium and Newmarket. The Victoria Memorial is one of the most attractive tourist places in Kolkata. 
It was opened in 1921 and named after the Queen of England, Queen Victoria. The Birla Planetarium, which is known as Tara Mandal, is also very famous. It is the largest in Asia and second largest in the world. The children learnt a lot of things about the outer space. The next day they went for a ride on the metro train. The children were thrilled to travel by the metro. The next morning, Raj and his family left for the station after bidding goodbye to the grandparents. Animal sounds. Lions roar. Ducklings quack. Especially when they want a snack. Turkeys gobble. Birdies tweet. Especially when they want to treat. Snakes go hiss. Cats meow. And dogs bow wow. Animal sounds. Lions roar. Ducklings quack. Especially when they want a snack. Turkeys gobble. Birdies tweet. Especially when they want to treat. Snakes go hiss. Cats meow. And dogs bow wow. Joginder returned home early from the office. Sarita was surprised to see her father return home so early. He told her that they were going to watch the movie Lincoln. Sarita was very happy. She told him that she remembered the Oscar award ceremony on TV where Daniel Day-Lewis received the award for best actor for his acting in The Lincoln. Sarita's mother, Meena, got busy to prepare tea for Joginder. Sarita requested her father to tell her about Abraham Lincoln. Joginder told her the story of Lincoln. He told her that Abraham Lincoln was one of the greatest leaders of America. He was the 16th president of the USA. Abraham Lincoln was born in Kentucky to Thomas Lincoln, and Nancy Hanks Lincoln. Later, the family shifted to Indiana. They made their living by hunting and farming. When Abraham Lincoln was nine years old, his mother died. After the death of Lincoln's mother, Lincoln's father married Sarah Bush Johnson. She encouraged Lincoln to read. Abraham Lincoln was mostly self-educated. Lincoln was fond of reading books. He took up different jobs. He studied law and took interest in politics. He was elected president in 1861. He was also re-elected. Abraham Lincoln strongly opposed slavery and banned it legally. In April 1865, Lincoln was assassinated by John Wykes Booth at Ford's Theatre. Baby ate a microchip, then grabbed a bottle, took a sip. He swallowed it and made a beep. And now he's thinking pretty deep. He's downloading his ABCs and calculating one, two, threes. He's memorizing useless facts while doing daddy's income tax. He's processing and now he thrives on feeding his internal drives. He's throwing fits and now he fights with ruthless bits and toothless bites. He must be feeling very smug. But hold on, baby caught a bug. Attempting to reboot in haste, he accidentally got erased. If you can't be a pine on the top of the hill, be a scrub in the valley, but be the best little scrub by the side of the rill. Be a bush if you can't be a tree.
If you can't be a bush, be a bit of the grass, and some highway happier make. If you can't be a musky, then just be a boss, but the liveliest boss in the lake. We can't all be captains, we've got to be crew. There's something for all of us here. There's big work to do, and there's lesser to do. And the task we must do is the near. If you can't be a highway, then just be a trail. If you can't be the sun, be a star. It isn't by size that you win or you fail. Be the best of whatever you are. Be a friend. You don't need money. Just the disposition sunny. Just the wish to help another. Get along some way or other. Just the kindly hand extended. Out to one who's unbefriended. Just the will to give or lend. This will make you someone's friend. Be a friend. You don't need glory. Friendship is a simple story. Pass by trifling errors blindly. Gaze on honest effort kindly. Cheer the youth who's bravely trying. Pity him who's sadly sighing. Just a little labor spend on the duties of a friend. Be a friend. The pay is bigger, though not written by a figure, than is earned by people clever in what's merely self-endeavor. You'll have friends instead of neighbors for the profits of your labors. You'll be richer in the end than a prince if you're a friend. Matilda Jane, you never look at any toy or picture book. I show you pretty things in vain. You must be blind, Matilda Jane. I ask you riddles, tell you tales, but all our conversation fails. I fear you are dumb, Matilda Jane. Matilda, darling, when I call, you never seem to hear at all. I shout with all my might and main. But you are so deaf, Matilda Jane. Matilda Jane, you needn't mind. For, though you are deaf and dumb and blind, there's someone loves you. It is plain, and that is me, Matilda Jane. Matilda Jane, you never look at any toy or picture book. I show you pretty things in vain. You must be blind, Matilda Jane. I ask you riddles, tell you tales, but all our conversation fails. I fear you are dumb, Matilda Jane. Matilda, darling, when I call, you never seem to hear at all. I shout with all my might and main. But you are so deaf, Matilda Jane. Matilda Jane, you needn't mind. For, though you are deaf and dumb and blind, there's someone loves you. It is plain. And that is me, Matilda Jane. Andrew had planned to go blackberrying with his friends. But all his plans were shattered when mother asked him to take some books to Mrs. Jones, who lived quite far away. Andrew loved his mother dearly and liked to help her whenever possible. Andrew gave a big smile and picked up the basket having four books in it. On his way to Mrs. Jones, Andrew met Peter and Charlotte and told them that he could not join them for he was going to Mrs. Jones' house. Mrs. Jones was very delighted to get back her books. She thanked Andrew for bringing the books to her. Mrs. Jones then asked Andrew to pluck blackberries from a big bramble in her backyard. Andrew ran to the backyard and plucked the blackberries and put them in his bag. He thanked Mrs. Jones and left for his home. Andrew went back home happily. His basket was full of blackberries. On the way, he once again met Peter and Charlotte. 
Andrew gave them some of his juicy blackberries. They were happy too. At home, Andrew's mother was very happy. She baked a big blackberry pie for Andrew. Will my ears grow long as grandpa's? What makes us look like kin? Tell me where'd I get long eyelashes? And where'd I get my chin? Where'd I get my ice cream sweet tooth? And this nose that wiggles when I talk? Where'd I get my dizzy daydreams? And my foot rolling sidestep walk? Did I inherit my sense of humor? And these crooked, ugly toes? What if I balloon like Uncle Harry and have to shave my nose? How long after I start growing, until I start to shrink? Am I going to lose my teeth someday? My hair? My mind? Do you think I'll be tall or short or thin or bursting at the seams? Am I naturally this crazy? Is it something in my genes? I'm more than who I am. I'm also who I'm from. It's a scary speculation. Who will I become? I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high over vales and hills, when all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils. Beside the lake, beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing in the breeze, continuous as the stars that shine and twinkle on the Milky Way, they stretched in never-ending line along the margin of a bay. Ten thousand saw I at a glance, tossing their heads in sprightly dance. The waves beside them danced, but they outdid the sparkling waves in glee. A poet could not but be gay, in such a jocund company. I gazed and gazed, but little thought, what wealth the show to me had brought. For oft when on my couch I lie, in vacant or in pensive mood, they flash upon that inward eye, which is the bliss of solitude. And then my heart with pleasure fills, and dances with the daffodils. Ding-dong, 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 I'll sing you a song. Tis about a little bird. He sat on a tree, and he sang to me, and I never said a word. Ding-dong, ding-dong, I'll sing you a song. Tis about a little mouse. He looked very cunning as I saw him running about my father's house. Ding-dong, ding-dong, I'll sing you a song. Tis about my little kitty. She's speckled all over, and I know you'll love her, for she is very pretty. Ding-dong, 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 I'll sing you a song. Tis about a little bird. He sat on a tree, and he sang to me, and I never said a word. Ding-dong, ding-dong, I'll sing you a song. Tis about a little mouse. He looked very cunning as I saw him running about my father's house. Ding-dong, ding-dong, I'll sing you a song. Tis about my little kitty. She's speckled all over, and I know you'll love her, for she is very pretty.
A wind came up out of the sea and said, O mists, make room for me. It hailed the ships and cried, Sail on, ye mariners, the night is gone, and hurried landward far away, crying, Awake, it is the day. It said unto the forest, Shout, hang all your leafy banners out. It touched the wood bird's folded wing and said, O bird, awake and sing. And o'er the farms, O Chanticleer, your clarion blow, the day is near. It whispered to the fields of corn, bow down and hail the coming morn. It shouted through the belfry tower, Awake, O bell, proclaim the hour. It crossed the churchyard with a sigh and said, not yet, in quiet lie. They rise like sudden fiery flowers that burst upon the night, then fall to earth in burning showers of crimson, blue and white. Like buds too wonderful to name, each miracle unfolds Folds, and Catherine wheels begin to flame like whirling marigolds. Rockets and Roman candles make an orchard of the sky where magic trees their petals shake upon each gazing eye. They rise like sudden fiery flowers that burst upon the night, then fall to earth in burning showers of crimson, blue and white. Like buds too wonderful to name, each miracle unfolds, and Catherine wheels begin to flame like whirling marigolds. Rockets and Roman candles make an orchard of the sky, where magic trees their petals shake upon each gazing eye. Don't ever ask a centipede to play a game of soccer. Remember, he has 50 pairs of sneakers in his locker. He dribbles 50 soccer balls with 50 pairs of shoes and kicks them all at once. He doesn't often lose. He's such a fierce competitor that if you ever meet, at first you'll see his hundred legs and then you'll see defeat. Don't ever ask a centipede to play a game of soccer. Remember, he has 50 pairs of sneakers in his locker. He dribbles 50 soccer balls with 50 pairs of shoes and kicks them all at once. He doesn't often lose. He's such a fierce competitor that if you ever meet, at first you'll see his hundred legs and then you'll see defeat. Miss Nidhi Sood enters the class looking very cheerful. She is about to discuss and plan a life skill project on the Friendship Day. Since it falls on Sunday, the students will celebrate it on Monday. She then asks children to suggest a special way to celebrate Friendship Day. Some children give suggestions, but Rahman's suggestion of bringing special dishes to school is liked by all. The friendship day comes. During the lunch, students wish one another and Nidhi Madam happy friendship day. They tie friendship bands and exchange cards. After this, they open their lunch boxes. Jaspinder has brought Chole Bhature Halwa. Rafiq has brought Sivaiya. Madhumita has brought rosogolas. Christina has brought Christmas cake. Ritu has brought gujiyas and Rahman has brought biryani. They all share and exchange their food items. After the party was over, Nidhi ma'am explained the importance of friends in one's life. She told the children that true friendship means sharing and caring.
Call out. Call loud. I am ready. Come and find me. The sacks in the tool shed smell like the seaside. They'll never find you in this salty dark. But be careful that your feet aren't sticking out. Wiser not to risk another shout. The floor is cold. They'll probably be searching the bushes near the swing. Whatever happens, you mustn't sneeze when they come prowling in. And here they are, whispering at the door. You've never heard them sound so hushed before. Don't breathe. Don't move. Stay dumb. Hide in your blindness. They're moving closer. Someone stumbles, mutters. Their words and laughter scuffle, and they're gone. But don't come out just yet. They'll try the lane, and then the greenhouse, and back here again. They must be thinking that you're very clever, getting more puzzled as they search all over. It seems a long time since they went away. Your legs are stiff. The cold bites through your coat. The dark, damp smell of sand moves in your throat. It's time to let them know that you're the winner. Push off the sacks, uncurl and stretch. That's better. Out of the shed and call to them. I've won. Here I am. Come and own up. I've caught you. The darkening garden watches. Nothing stirs. The bushes hold their breath. The sun is gone. Yes, here you are. But where are they who sought you? Half Hopper Green is a comical chap. He lives on the best of fare: bright little trousers, jacket, and cap. These are his summer wear. Out in the meadow, he loves to go. Playing away in the sun, it's hopperty, skipperty, high and low. Summer's the time for fun. Grasshopper Green has a dozen wee boys, and soon as their legs grow strong, each of them joins in his frolicsome joys, singing his merry song. Under the hedge, in a happy row, soon as the day has begun, it's hopperty, skipperty, high and low. Summer's the time for fun. Grasshopper Green has a quaint little house. It's under the hedge, so gay. Grandmother Spider, as still as a mouse, watches him over the way. Gladly he's calling the children. I know, out in the beautiful sun. It's hopperty, skipperty, high and low. Summer's the time for fun. I take it you already know of tough and bow and cough and dough. Others may stumble, but not you. On hiccup, furrow, laugh, and through. Well done. And now you wish, perhaps, to learn of these familiar traps. Beware of herd, a dreadful word that looks like beard and sounds like bird and dead. It said like bed, not bead. For goodness' sake, don't call it deed. Watch out for meat and great and threat. They rhyme with sweet and straight and debt. A moth is not a moth in mother, nor both in bother, broth in brother. And here is not a match for there, nor dear and fear for bear and pear. And then there's does and rose and lose. Just look them up and goose and choose, and cork and front and word and ward and font and front and word and sword and do and go and thwart and cart. Come, come, I've hardly made a start. A dreadful language, man alive. I had mastered it when I was five.
I am a polar bear. I live north of everywhere. I live at the top of the world. The furry white coat I wear in the snow keeps me warm when it's twenty below. I am a polar bear. I live north of everywhere. I live at the top of the world. Fishing in the ice and swimming in the sea makes living at the North Pole perfect for me. I am a polar bear. I live north of everywhere. I live at the top of the world. We hear a bell ring, ding a ling ling. We hear a loud call, come one, come all. Chocolate and cola, mango and vanilla, orange and lime. It's ice cream time. A scoop in a cup does not fill it up. Maybe a cone crunchy, so yummy and so munchy. Stop, wait, let me think. Why not buy an ice stick pink? Not one, not two, but three for my new friends and me. Come, let us all have some fun licking ice sticks in the sun. We hear a bell ring, ding a ling ling. We hear a loud call. Come one, come all. Chocolate and cola, mango and vanilla, orange and lime. It's ice cream time. A scoop in a cup does not fill it up. Maybe a cone crunchy, so yummy and so munchy. Stop, wait, let me think. Why not buy an ice stick pink? Not one, not two, but three for my new friends and me. Come, let us all have some fun licking ice sticks in the sun. What do you sell, O oh ye merchants? Richly your wares are displayed. Turbans of crimson and silver, tunics of purple brocade, mirror with panels of amber, daggers with handles of jade. What do you weigh, O oh ye vendors? Saffron and lentil and rice. What do you grind, O oh ye maidens? Sandalwood, henna and spice. What do you call, O oh ye peddlers? Chessmen and ivory dice. What do you make, O oh ye goldsmiths? Wristlet and anklet and ring. Bells for the feet of blue pigeons. Frail as a dragonfly's wing. Girdles of gold for the dancers. Scabbards of gold for the king. What do you cry, O oh ye fruitmen? Citron, pomegranate and plum. What do you play, O oh musicians? Sitar, sarangi, and drum. What do you chant, O oh magicians? Spells for the aeons to come. What do you weave, O oh ye flower girls? With tassels of osier and red? Crown for the brow of a bridegroom. Chaplets to garland his bed. Sheets of white blossoms new garnered to perfume the sleep of the dead. Weavers, weaving at break of day. Why do you weave a garment so gay? Blue as the wing of a halcyon wild, we weave the robes of a newborn child. Weavers, weaving at fall of night, why do you weave a garment so bright? Like the plumes of a peacock, purple and green, we weave the marriage veils of a queen. Weavers, weaving solemn and still, what do you weave in the moonlight chill? 
white as a feather, and white as a cloud. We weave a dead man's funeral shroud. Weavers, weaving at break of day. Why do you weave a garment so gay? Blue as the wing of a halcyon wild, we weave the robes of a newborn child. Weavers, weaving at fall of night, why do you weave a garment so bright? Like the plumes of a peacock, purple and green, we weave the marriage veils of a queen. Weavers, weaving solemn and still, what do you weave in the moonlight chill? White as a feather and white as a cloud, we weave a dead man's funeral shroud. Many Indian women took part in the London Olympics in 2012. Among them, Mary Com and Saina Nehwal became famous as they won bronze medals in their respective fields. Mary Com is a well-known woman boxer of India. She is the first Indian woman boxer to win a medal at the Olympics. Mary Com was born in a simple family. She used to work in field with her parents. Her inspiration was Manipuri boxer Dinko Singh. Mary Com has won many national and international championships. She has been conferred with Arjuna, Padmashri and Rajiv Gandhi Khel Ratna Awards. Saina Nehwal is India's best badminton player. She won the bronze medal in London Olympics 2012. She was ranked number 2 by the Badminton World Federation in 2010. She has won many international championships too. She has been awarded the Arjuna Award and Rajiv Gandhi Khel Ratna. If you give a mouse a motorcycle, don't be too surprised if he starts behaving strangely once he knows he's motorized. He may act a bit bizarrely. He may dress a little weird. He might buy a leather jacket and then grow a honkin beard. When he straps a helmet on his head and boots upon his feet, then you'll see him pop a wheelie and go racing down the street. Pretty soon he'll find he's fond of doing motorcycle tricks. He'll be jumping over cars and trucks and buses just for kicks. He'll start working at the circus where he'll take away your breath as he rides with other rodents in the flaming cage of death. When he accidentally crashes, he'll have no more fun and games, just the screech of twisting metal as his bike explodes in flames. And without his motorcycle, he'll be fired from his job. He'll become depressed and lonely and a sad and smelly slob. And the only way to save him from this misery and pain is to buy another motorbike so he can start again. So remember this advice. Don't even trust him with your keys. If you need to give a mouse a gift, it's best to stick with cheese. When the green woods laugh with the voice of joy and the dimpling stream runs laughing by, when the air does laugh with our merry wit and the green hill laughs with the noise of it, when the meadows laugh with lively green and the grasshopper laughs in the merry scene, when Mary and Susan and Emily with their sweet round mouths sing, ha, ha, hey, when the painted birds laugh in the shade where our table with cherries and nuts is spread, Come live and be merry and join with me to sing the sweet chorus of Ha Ha He. Where do the fish go when the monsoon thunders on the water 
and the foam churns like milk. Where do the birds hide when the trees fall in high winds, and all the fruit lies everywhere on field and ground? Where do people run when the rain comes through the thatch and the floods creep in on them like thieves? Where do the fish go when the monsoon thunders on the water and the foam churns like milk? Where do the birds hide when the trees fall in high winds and all the fruit lies everywhere on field and ground? Where do people run when the rain comes through the thatch and the floods creep in on them like thieves? I think I could turn and live with animals. They are so placid and self-contained. I stand and look at them long and long. They do not sweat and whine about their condition. They do not lie awake in the dark and weep for their sins. They do not make me sick discussing their duty to God. Not one is dissatisfied, not one is demented with the mania of owning things. Not one kneels to another, nor to his kind that lived thousands of years ago. Not one is respectable or unhappy over the whole earth. So they show their relations to me, and I accept them. They bring me tokens of myself. They evince them plainly in their possession. I wonder where they get those tokens. Did I pass that way huge times ago and negligently drop them? A duck and a porcupine, no one knows how, contrary to grammar, are a ducupine now. The stork told the tortoise, isn't this fun? As the stortoise, we are second to none. The parrot-faced lizard felt rather silly. Must he give up insects and start eating chili? The goat charged the scorpion at a rapid run, jumped on his back, now head and tail are one. The giraffe lost his taste for roaming far and wide. Like a grasshopper, he'd rather jump and glide. The cow said, Am I sick too from this disease? Or why should the rooster chase me, if you please? And oh, the poor Ellie whale, that was a bungle. While whale yearns for the sea, Ellie wants the jungle. The hornbill was desperate as it had no horns. Merged with a deer now, it no longer mourns. Something there is that doesn't love a wall, that sends the frozen ground swell under it, and spills the upper boulders in the sun, and makes gaps even two can pass abreast. The work of hunters is another thing. I have come after them and made repair, where they have left not one stone on a stone, but they would have the rabbit out of hiding, to please the yelping dogs. The gaps, I mean. No one has seen them made or heard them made. But at spring mending time, we find them there. I let my neighbor know beyond the hill. And on a day, we meet to walk the line, and set the wall between us once again. We keep the wall between us as we go, to each the boulders that have fallen to each, and some are lows, and some so nearly balls. We have to use a spell to make them balance. Stay where you are until our backs are turned. We wear our fingers rough with handling them. Oh, just another kind of outdoor game. One on a side, it comes to little more. There where it is, we do not need the wall. He is all pine, and I am apple orchard. My apple trees will never get across, and eat the cones under his pines, I tell him. He only says, good fences, 
Make good neighbors. Spring is the mischief in me, and I wonder if I could put a notion in his head. Why do they make good neighbors? Isn't it where there are cows? But here there are no cows. Before I built a wall, I'd ask to know what I was walling in or walling out, and to whom I was like to give offense. Something there is that doesn't love a wall, that wants it down. I could say elves to him, but it's not elves exactly, and I'd rather he said it for himself. I see him there, bringing a stone grasped firmly by the top in each hand, like an old stone savage armed. He moves in darkness as it seems to me not of woods only and the shade of trees he will not go behind his father's saying and he likes having thought of it so well he says again good fences make good neighbors i'm a moonwalker walking on the moon i'm a jungle stalker Stalking wild baboons. I'm a superhero, skimming through the blue. Puddle jumping, leaf pile leaping. I'm a kangaroo. I'm a desert rattlesnake, sliding through the sand. Counting out the beat, I'm the leader of the band. I'm Tyrannosaurus, looking for a snack. Woohoo! I'm a train rolling down the track. I'm a red eyed robo, clanking up the road. I'm an 18 wheeler with a heavy load. I'm a famous rock star, moving very cool. Actually, I'm just me, walking home from school. I'm a moonwalker, walking on the moon. I'm a jungle stalker, stalking wild baboons. I'm a superhero, skimming through the blue. Puddle jumping, leaf pile leaping. I'm a kangaroo. I'm a desert rattlesnake, sliding through the sand. Counting out the beat, I am the leader of the band. I am Tyrannosaurus, looking for a snack. Woohoo! I am a train rolling down the track. I am a red-eyed robo, clanking up the road. I am an 18-wheeler with a heavy load. I am a famous rock star, moving very cool. Actually, I am just me, walking home from school. It was the time when lilies blow, and clouds are highest up in air. Lord Ronald brought a lily-white doe to give his cousin, Lady Clare. I trow they did not part in scorn. Lovers long betrothed were they. They too will wed the morrow morn. God's blessing on the day. He does not love me for my birth nor for my lands so broad and fair. He loves me for my own true worth, and that is well, said Lady Clare. In there came old Alice the nurse, said, Who was this that went from thee? It was my cousin, said Lady Clare. Tomorrow he weds with me. Oh, God be thanked, said Alice the nurse that all comes round so just and fair. Lord Ronald is heir of all your lands, and you are not the Lady Clare. Are ye out of your mind, my nurse, my nurse? said Lady Clare, that ye speak so wild? As gods above, said Alice the nurse, I speak the truth, you are my child. The old earl's daughter died at my breast. I speak the truth as I live by bread. I buried her like my own sweet child and put my child in her stead. Falsely, falsely have ye done, O mother, she said, if this be true, to keep the best man under the sun so many years from his due. Nay, now, my child, said Alice the nurse, but keep the secret for your life. 
and all you have will be Lord Ronald's when you are man and wife. If I'm a beggar born, she said, I will speak out, for I dare not lie. Pull off, pull off the brooch of gold, and fling the diamond necklace by. Nay now, my child, said Alice the nurse, but keep the secret all ye can. She said, Not so, but I will know if there be any faith in man. Nay now, what faith? said Alice the nurse. The man will cleave unto his right. And he shall have it, the lady replied, though I should die tonight. Yet give one kiss to your mother, dear. Alas, my child, I sinned for thee. Oh, mother, 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 she said. So strange it seems to me. Yet here's a kiss for my mother dear, my mother dear, if this be so. And lay your hand upon my head, and bless me, mother, ere I go. She clad herself in a russet gown. She was no longer Lady Clare. She went by dale, and she went by down, with a single rose in her hair. The lily-white doe Lord Ronald had brought leapt up from where she lay, dropped her head in the maiden's hand, and followed her all the way. Down stepped Lord Ronald from his tower. Oh, Lady Clare, you shame your worth. Why come you dressed like a village maid that are the flower of the earth? If I come dressed like a village maid, I am but as my fortunes are. I am a beggar born, she said. And not the Lady Clare. Play me no tricks, said Lord Ronald. For I am yours in word and in deed. Play me no tricks, said Lord Ronald. Your riddle is hard to read. Oh, and proudly stood she up. Her heart within her did not fail. She looked into Lord Ronald's eyes and told him all her nurse's tale. He laughed a laugh of merry scorn. He turned and kissed her where she stood. If you are not the heiress born, and I, said he, the next in blood, if you are not the heiress born, and I, said he, the lawful heir, we two will wed tomorrow morn, and you shall still be Lady Clare. We were taken from the ore bed and the mine. We were melted in the furnace and the pit. We were cast and wrought and hammered to design. We were cut and filed and tooled and gauged to fit some water, coal, and oil is all we ask, and a thousandth of an inch to give us play. And now, if you will set us to our task, we will serve you four and twenty hours a day. We can pull and haul and push and lift and drive. We can print and plough and weave and heat and light. We can run and jump and swim and fly and dive. We can see and hear and count and read and write. Would you call a friend from half across the world? If you let us have his name and town and state, you shall see and hear your crackling question hurled across the arch of heaven while you wait. Has he answered? Does he need you at his side? And take the western ocean in the stride of thirty thousand horses and some screws. The boat express is waiting your command. You will find the Mauritania at the quay till her captain turns the lever neath his hand and the monstrous nine-decked city goes to sea. Do you wish to make the mountains bare 
bare their head and lay their new cut forests at your feet? Do you want to turn a river in its bed and plant a barren wilderness with wheat? Shall we pipe aloft and bring you water down from the never failing cisterns of the snows to work the mills and tramways in your town and irrigate your orchards as it flows? It is easy. Give us dynamite and drills. Watch the iron shouldered rocks lie down and quake as the thirsty desert level floods and fills and the valley we have dammed becomes a lake. But remember, please, the law by which we live. We are not built to comprehend a lie. We can neither love, nor pity, nor forgive. If you can make a slip in handling us, you die. We are greater than the peoples or the kings. Be humble as you crawl beneath our rods. Our touch can alter all created things. We are everything on earth, except the gods. Though our smoke may hide the heavens from your eyes, it will vanish and the stars will shine again. Because, for all our power and weight and size, we are nothing more than children of your brain. I know a funny little man, as quiet as a mouse, who does the mischief that is done in everybody's house. There's no one ever sees his face, and yet we all agree that every plate we break was cracked by Mr. Nobody. Tis he who always tears our books, who leaves the door ajar, he pulls the buttons from our shirts and scatters pins afar. That squeaking door will always squeak, for pretty, don't you see? We leave the oiling to be done by Mr. Nobody. The finger marks upon the door by none of us are made. We never leave the blind unclosed to let the curtains fade. The ink we never spill. The boots that lying round you see are not our boots, they all belong. To Mr. Nobody. I have a rabbit in a hutch, and I love him very much. He has a bed of hay, and I feed him every day. I have a kitten, soft and furry, and she is very, very purry. Her coat is soft as silk, and she's very fond of milk. I have a dog. He's best of all, how he loves a game of ball. His tail is full of wags, and I call him dear old rags. I have a rabbit in a hutch, and I love him very much. He has a bed of hay, and I feed him every day. I have a kitten, soft and furry, and she is very, very purry. Her coat is soft as silk, and she's very fond of milk. I have a dog. He's best of all, how he loves a game of ball. His tail is full of wags, and I call him dear old rags. I know a little cupboard with a teeny tiny key, and there's a jar of lollipops for me, me, me. It has a little shelf, my dear, as dark as dark can be. And there's a dish of Bunbury cakes for me, me, me. I have a small fat grandmama with a very slippery knee. And she's keeper of the cupboard with the key, key, key. And when I'm very good, my dear, as good as good can be, there's Bunbury cakes and lollipops for me, me. Me. I know a little cupboard with a teeny tiny key and there's a jar of lollipops for me, me, me. It has a little shelf, my dear, as dark as dark can be. And there's a dish of Bunbury cakes for me, me, me. 
I have a small fat grandmama with a very slippery knee and she's keeper of the cupboard with the key, key, key. And when I'm very good, my dear, as good as good can be, there's bunberry cakes and lollipops for me, me, me. I have a little shadow that goes in and out with me, and what can be the use of him is more than I can see. He is very, very like me from the heels up to the head, and I see him jump before me when I jump into bed. The funniest thing about him is the way he likes to grow, not at all like proper children, which is always very slow, for he sometimes shoots up taller like an India rubber ball. And he sometimes gets so little that there's none of him at all. He hasn't got a notion of how children ought to play and can only make a fool of me in every sort of way. He stays so close behind me. He's a coward, you can see. I'd think shame to stick to Nursie as that shadow sticks to me. One morning, very early, before the sun was up, I rose and found the shining dew on every buttercup, but my lazy little shadow, like an errant sleepy head, had stayed at home behind me and was fast asleep in bed. It was another usual day for Mousy. He stretched on the big armchair and yawned. His parents would leave for office soon. His food would be ready on the table as usual. The one thing Mousy hated the most was boredom. Mr. and Mrs. Mouse hurriedly moved to the front door after giving Mousy a warm hug. They warned him not to go outside alone and to stay away from the window. They also told him not to swing on the small lampshade in the other room. Once the father and mother mouse left, Mousy leaped up. Mousy loved to swing from the big lampshade. He had broken it just the previous day and hurt his toe badly. He looked around for something interesting to play with. Just the previous week he had broken a window glass when he threw a ball at a birdie sitting outside staring at him. Mousy wondered why his family and relatives called him naughty. Mousy's house had a small window. Suddenly, he heard a big noise. He ran to the window. He was thrilled to see new neighbours. The doorbell rang. Mousy ran to the gate and opened it. A mouse of his own age stood at the gate. He introduced himself as Max Mousy. Max Mousy told that he loved adventures. He invited Mousy to come with him to the hilltop to explore it. Soon they got out. Max Mousy ran ahead with Mousy behind. Up and down the trees they went deep in the forest. The big and small leaves were just wonderful. They chewed some pine nuts. They were delicious. They looked down the forest. The view was simply awesome. Suddenly, a black cloud appeared over Mousy's head from nowhere. He looked up. The cloud rushed towards him very fast. He let out a shriek. It was a big eagle with its claws about to clutch him. He felt the eagle's breath. Mousy ran as fast as he could. Suddenly he slipped and fell into a ditch. He rolled and rolled. He did many somersaults. Within a second, he landed next to the window of his house. He ran and collapsed on the sofa. When his parents returned home in the evening, he promised that he would not be naughty anymore.